rather chilly UK. It's certainly uh, winter has arrived, shall we say. Um, but what better way to celebrate the start of December than by welcoming one of my favourite champagne houses, Louis Rodera, to a, um, a really exciting evening, actually. We've got a beautiful background on the house, followed by a tasting of three wines and a little bit of chat about two upcoming wines as well. And then we'll finish with some questions this evening. So those of you who are dialing in on YouTube, sorry that you're not able to answer, uh, ask any questions, but we are going to manage the uh, external email. So if you do have a question and you're watching via YouTube, please email tastings at thewinesociety.com and we'll keep an eye. Otherwise, if you're joining here in Zoom, then please do use that Q&A button. If you type your questions in, the lovely Tim Schwilk behind the scenes tonight will be able to manage the questions for you and pass them over to myself. Uh, I'm the very, very lucky host with the wines tonight. Um, apologies from Sarah Knowles MW as well, who is unable to join us this evening, but I'm all the happier for it because it does mean that I get to taste along this evening with Mark and Alexi. And I can see, last but not least, some of you have already started using our chat. Please let us know where you are, what you're drinking. I can see already some members drinking the 242 collection, some drinking the 243. Just remember that when you are writing where you are and what you're drinking, to select everyone, not just hosts and panellists, because otherwise only ourselves will be able to see. So without further ado, I am delighted to be able to introduce Mark Bingley, MW. So good evening, Mark. Mark joins us, joins us pardon me, from MMD, a uh, longtime friends of the Wine Society. And Mark is, uh, uh, well, far more knowledgeable, shall we say, and is going to do a much better introduction to Alexi than I am. And I'm delighted that I can raise a real glass of champagne, one of my first in December, or maybe my first in December, I think it is. Uh, and what a way to start. I'm having a glass of quartet to begin. So cheers, Mark, and thank you for this evening. Well, it's a pleasure. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I, I can't see you, but I think you can see me. Uh, and I'm clutching a glass of quartet. Um, so we are very lucky that from Reims in Champagne, um, Alexi Delini, who is the export manager for Louis Roder Champagne, um, is here this evening to talk us through the story of the House of Roder and its long history and explain about the wines. And uh, from time to time, uh, he will ask me something, I suspect, or I'll make a comment. And, and hopefully we'll have a few questions uh, from you. Uh, and we're very happy to answer those um, uh, as, as best we can. And um, we, are, we are delighted, as, as Anna said, um, we have been uh, working together um, as the importer of Louis Rodra's champagnes with the Wine Society for many, many, many decades, and um, which is terrific. And, and I know a Wine Society members uh, love Louis Rodra love good champagne so i think we're going to have a, a nice evening so alexi uh, would you like to start um and uh, tell us all about the house of rodera yeah of course hi hi everyone uh, like mark said you you can't uh, i can i can see you but you can see us so thank you very much for joining us tonight uh thanks anna thanks max for the introduction uh cheers to everyone because I myself have a glass of, of champagne, which is great. Uh, so just before we go into the, the tasting, it's always good to have a, a better vision and uh, of the of the house and some uh, some history. So as you probably know, Louis Rodrer dates back from a long time because uh, the, the Maison was created in 1776. Uh, but before it was Louis Rodrer, uh, in 1776, the uh, Maison, because it was not a Maison, it was a negociant, it was called Dubois Perifice. Uh, so in fact, it was uh, two, um, two, two persons, so the father and, and the son, who created this company. And at first, it was just a negociant company. So the, the, this company didn't own any, uh, any, uh, any land, any vineyards. They just bought grapes and they uh, vinified the, the grapes. And uh, after uh, after a few years, uh, the, the the members of the company sold the company to one of their employees, uh, who's called Nicolas Schreider. And Nicolas Schreider was an old man and kind of alone. He, he didn't have any heir, so he asked his nephew to come from Alsace to help him running the company. 
and his nephew was in fact Louis Rodrer. So that's when Louis Rodrer came into Champagne, in fact, in 1827. And after that, so uh, unfortunately, Mr. Schreider passed away uh, and, uh, and Louis Rodrer took over the company in 1833 and directly gave uh, the company his name. So that's why uh, in reality, the Louis Rodrer Maison has really got the name in 1833. And uh, by, by that time, um, Louis Rodrer had the vision. So he didn't want to buy grapes anymore because he knew he had this vision that owning the land, farming the land was much better than just buying grapes. So he started to uh, invest, he started to uh, look into the best plots in the Champagne, uh, to the best uh, terroir in Champagne as well, to farm the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, and the Meunier. And by the time of uh, the 1850s, he already owned 100 hectares, which was uh, at, at this time of the, of the, of the, at this time, a really huge surface in, uh, in Champagne, because he knew that he could control the quality process from the beginning, from the land, to, to the bottle, in fact. So after that, after a few, few years, a lot of uh, different family members uh, run the company um, until, until the 1930s, when Louis Rodrer was in fact almost bankrupt, because at that time, uh, we had two big export markets, which were Russia from one side, the biggest one, and then the US. And by that time, we had the prohibition in the US and a few years before the Russian Revolution. Um, so uh, Russia, as you probably know, has a big history with Louis Rodrer because we were the biggest uh, uh, shipper in, uh, in Russia of all champagne. Uh, in, uh, in, at the top of the sales, we, we shipped approximately 600,000 bottles of champagne to Russia for Louis Rodrer. So it was a huge, huge uh, amount of bottles. And that's why the Tsar Alexander II was a big, big fan of, of Rodrer. And he asked uh, Louis Rodrer, in fact, the son of Louis Rodrer, so Louis Rodrer II, he asked him to produce a special cuvee just for him. Uh, and that's when uh, uh, Crystal was, uh, was created in 1876. Um, and as you know, the Tsar was kind of uh, uh, paranoid. So he asked Louis Rodrer to produce uh, this wine in a transparent bottle so he could see through it if the wine was not poison. And also with the, the bottom with a flat bottom so we couldn't put any bomb uh, inside, which was kind of, kind of crazy. And, uh, and uh, the name Crystal comes from the fact that uh, back in the days, the bottle was made from this material, from crystal, in fact, that we don't use anymore, of course, because it's too uh, too fragile. So we don't. May, we, may uh, I may I add one point? Yeah, of course, man. Uh, Please do. Alexi, I don't think the Tsar Alexander II was crazy because, in yes, fact, because the poor exactly. man was actually assassinated <laughs> with <laughs> a bomb. Exactly. But, but but of course, I'm glad to say it wasn't a bottle of Louis Rodra or Crystal that, no, had, that no. contained the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Exactly, exactly. So in fact, in the in the 1930s, we lost we lost uh, Russia as a market because um, the the image of Champagne and the image of Louis Rodra was associated to the Tsar. So nobody wanted to drink champagne and to consume this, this product anymore. So we, we lost this market, which was uh, our biggest one. And also, uh, like I was saying, US because of the prohibition. Um, so it was really tough at this time for, uh, for Louis Rodrer. But we had uh, an amazing woman coming uh, to run the company um, who was Camille Olry Rodrer. And she was the granddaughter of Louis Rodrer II. And during 40 years, she fought a lot to uh, try to promote the brand, to expand the sales to a lot of different countries. Uh, and she succeeded really well. Uh, and her specialty was to, in fact, to uh, invite a lot of people to Champagne, to Rims, at the mansion, at the family mansion, to promote the wine, to taste the wine. Uh, and, and that's how she uh, succeeded to uh, uh, put the company back, back on track, in fact. So she was really important uh, for, the, for, the, for the history of the house. And that's why uh, Frédéric Pozo, our current CEO, actually uh, released uh, a Coteau Champenois a few years ago uh, by the name of Camille. It was homage à Camille, so it's a tribute to Camille because her grandmother, her great grandmother, sorry, was really, really important for the, for the house. So when Camille uh, passes away, unfortunately, uh, in the 70s, 1970s, it was uh, her, grand, uh, her grandson, Jean-Claude Rousseau, who took over the company. Uh, and Jean-Claude Rousseau uh, is an enologist, so he knew uh, the wine and the terroir, everything really well. 
uh, he vinified the wine as well. Um, and he was the first who created um, Cristal Rosé, in fact, in 1974. Um, and after that, he was also the first to um, expand the group Louis Rodrer and to invest outside of the company itself. And the first invest investment he made was, in fact, in California in 1982 with Rodrer Estate. Um, after uh, Jean-Claude Rousseau uh, retired, it was, uh, as you can see on the right picture, Frédéric Rousseau, uh, who took over the company in 2006. And Frédéric Rousseau kept this vision of uh, investing and expanding the, the, the group by, uh, by uh, buying and, and investing in a lot of different wineries. Uh, so now, if you take the whole group, so now Louis Roder is a group, it's called Roderer Collection. And uh, inside the group, we have, uh, so of course, uh, Roderer Estate, but also other wineries in, in California, uh, with Diamond Creeks, with Mary Edwards, uh, with Scharfenberger as well. We have winery in Provence with Domaine Hot. We have wineries in Bordeaux with Chateau de Pes, saint Estève, and uh, the second growth, uh, Pichon Comtesse in Poyac. Uh, we have uh, Adriano Ramos Pinto in Portugal, uh, Delas in the Rhone Valley, and also Champagne Dutz, which belong to uh, Louis Rodin. So it's, in fact, a big group. And the idea is to invest uh, always in uh, family wineries where we keep the people. Because, for example, if you take Domaine Hot, uh, which is in Provence, it's still the Hot family who is running the, the company. If you take Ramos Pinto, it's still the Rosas family who is, who is running the company. So the idea is to really invest in top quality wineries and to keep the people who uh, did a great job for this uh, during these many years and keep this top quality of, uh, of wine. So this is really interesting to, to work at World in fact, because we don't only talk about champagne, but of, about all different wines. And this is really always, uh, always interesting. So just to, to give you some key figures about the, about the house. So now we Rodrer is a house who's producing about 4 million bottles a year, which is still uh, quite uh, small if you compare to uh, what we call the big house, uh, Moite Chardon, who is about 35 million bottles. So as you can see, it's completely different. And our, our priority is once again to work on top quality uh, wine. Um, and because we are a completely, an, completely independent company and we are not a financial group, I mean, Frédéric Rousseau and his father are, are the only shareholder of the company. Uh, this means that we can really uh, take some risks, a uh, measured risk, of course, but we can make some decision like, for example, uh, organic viticulture or the fact that we own uh, most of our vineyards uh, to, to, to produce our wine. So as you can, as you can see uh, on the map uh, of the vineyard, um, so this is all of all the Louis Rodra vineyard. So like I was saying, we own, because we kept this vision of Louis Rodra uh, that had 100 hectares back in the days. And today, Louis Rodra uh, owns 242 hectares, which represents approximately 70% of our needs. So we only buy 30% of grapes and we only buy Meunier. So we don't buy Chardonnay, we don't buy Pinot Noir, and the Meunier that we buy is only to put into our collection here, uh, two for two. Uh, but we, and all the other wines of the range are uh, coming from 100% of our vineyards. So once again, the, the fact that we own our lands and we, we farm our own grapes makes, makes a, a tremendous difference. Um, so as you can see on the map, we are located in all the different regions of, of uh, of Champagne, so you have the Montagne de Reims, uh, which is famous for the Pinot Noir, the Vallée de la Marne for the Meunier, and in the south, the famous Côte des Blancs, which is uh, um, great for Chardonnay, in fact. We also have in Champagne another location a little bit more in south, which is called Aube, but we have no, no vineyards in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this location. Um, so like I was saying, so we, we just we just buy 30% of the of the grapes and by, by buying these grapes, we have long term contracts with our uh, partners. That means that we always go during the year, we, we often go to their vineyard to see how uh, it's farmed, uh, because as you as you probably know, we have uh, we have a certification of organic viticulture now. So we try to um, push the, the good uh, the good. Um, let's say the good, um, I don't know how to say that, but the good uh, things to our partners, uh, the good methods to our partners. 
Um, and this is really important for us to be present and to talk to them and to show them how to how to do it. I mean, could could we could we perhaps just add to that that the um, uh, in charge of viticulture and in charge of all production is uh, Jean Baptiste Le Caillon, who has been with the company now for thirty years. Exactly. And uh, Jean Baptiste, I think, is considered the the leading expert uh, in the whole Champagne region for uh, really looking forward the future of, of viticulture yeah. in the region, including how to handle viticulture with climate change. And I think that's another really important thing. And in fact, what's rather nice, you see the middle picture there uh, of the horses in the vineyard. That's actually one of the vineyards that are used for crystal production. And uh, and they are they're now, uh, a lot of the vineyards actually are farmed biodynamically. And, uh, and of course, that means not only are they not using any uh, pesticides and herbicides, but they're trying to use the natural energy of the soil, of the sunshine, and so on, mm -hmm. to look after the vines. And, and, and if the vines are very healthy and the soils are healthy, then they think they'll get, they know they'll get very healthy fruit and you'll make wonderful wine. So this is really, really important. And that's what they're doing, looking forward. And eventually, I think this sort of influence is having a big change, creating a big change in the whole Champagne region, where there is a movement now for the entire area to stop using pesticides and herbicides. So it's not only sustainability, but it's also, you know, not poisoning the soils, which is just so important, which is which is really and and Louis Rodra really are taking a lead in that. And in fact, now today, I think is that right, Alexia? They're the biggest farmers biodynamically in terms of area of hectare that they uh, farm i so think bio, they're the biggest so sorry bio, biodynamically uh, maybe not but organically that's for sure we had the we had the certification uh, in 2021 and we are certified organic with 115 hectares which is half half of our vineyards and of course the idea is to go fully organic in the in the years to come but it's a really uh, tough challenge uh, I think I think we're one of the biggest regarding biodynamic. That's that's for sure. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. But the idea is really to go to go further. But it's it's tough, you know. As you know, the climate in Champagne is is not really uh, uh, really easy, easier than in uh, than in UK, I should say. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, no no no. It's it's really the, the idea when you when you know that only two percent of the surface in Champagne are certified organic. I think that. As one of the most famous one in the world, I think we really have to show the way and to lead the way. And I think that at Rodrer, this is what we this is what we do. And Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon has this vision of going uh, um, organically. And it's not it's not a, a, a marketing organic viticulture. You know, a lot of big houses they went to organic viticulture because it was it's kind of the trend for the consumer because the consumer wants now more organic uh, products. Uh, but the fact, the, the reality is that we have been working organically since uh, for the last for the last twenty years. So we 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 have to be certified now because we can show the proof that we are certified. That's for sure, and because consumers are asking for that now. Uh, but we've been working in this way since uh, since uh, yeah two thousand the years two thousand. So this is really important for us, and we want to keep uh, to keep it going. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so we talked about the surface uh, horses. Mark talked about that as well. Uh, maybe we can have a little tour in the cellar. I'm sure. Yes, here we are in the cellars. Um, so the cellars, once again, is kind of a, of a unique at Rodrer because all of our reserve wine are aged in big oak barrels, so that we call food. So you know, it's not uh, small barrels to bring woody aromas. It's just big ones to bring the micro oxygenation and to to bring some complexity to the wine. The two the two biggest words and the the two uh, uh, biggest ideas for Rodrer is to have freshness and complexity. So the complexity you have it with the uh, wooden casks like this on the left picture, and uh, due to the climate change, like Mark was mentioning. We had to uh, find new ways to produce and to vinify the wine. Um, so first at Rodrer, it's kind of, of, of uh, it's easier now to produce champagne because you know at Rodrer, except collection, all of our champagne are vintages. 
So the fact that the ch uh, climate change is happening, it, it's good for us because the all the years now are better. So we have more sugar, more concentration, but we lack a little bit of acidity. And as you know, the acidity in the wine is, is really the, the structure and the skeleton of the wine. So we really need to keep this acidity and this freshness in the wine. And that's why uh, Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon created in 2012 what he calls the Perpetual Reserve. So it's a big, it's a big vat, uh, stainless steel vats. And each year, each harvest, he add uh, the new harvest in this uh, Reserve Perpetual. So for example, if we take uh, 242, but we'll talk about it later, but uh, we created the, the Reserve Perpetual in 2012. And each year, each vintage, he add a part of the of the harvest in this stainless steel vat. So for two for two, we have from 2012 until uh, 2016, in fact. And and the fact that uh, this wine stays in a stainless steel uh, vat without any oxygen and at temperature control, that brings a lot of freshness and a lot of energy to the wine. And that's how we try to uh, balance the complexity and the freshness now. So it's a real, uh, really a new new process to, to, to vinify our wines. And also what we do is that we have almost no malolactic fermentation in Champagne. Most of the houses have, uh, the product, they do the malolactic fermentation. So malolactic, so you go from the malo, uh, malic fermentation acid to the lactic acid. So your level of acidity is dropping, uh, which is good for the wine because it's easier to drink, but you also lose some flavors, which is not good. And we don't want to lose any flavors in our wines. So we don't do, or we really do a small uh, malolactic fermentation to keep the freshness in our wines and to keep um, and to allow our wines to age longer. So if you take, for example, a collection or even a vintage or even crystal, crystal in, in good conditions, you can keep it for 20, 25, 30 years, absolutely no problem. And people sometimes they don't really know that champagne can be aged for this, this, uh, this long. They think that it's a uh, wine to drink uh, really uh, young and uh, with, uh, uh, no, not, not ice cubes in it, but uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> almost some time. So no, 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 it's a real wine. If you take a Grand Cru from Bordeaux that can be aged for 30 years, with a good champagne, of course, it has to be a good champagne, but it can be the, the same. Um, I hope you don't mind, Alexia. I'm just going to ask. Um, we did have a question. I think I think you've largely answered it. But John asked, to what extent does the use of those reserve wines create more complexity um, than, it, than is possible on even vintages? And then he's asked, does the sort of Solera system, how is it different to the Crianza type structure? Crianza type structure of sherry. Yeah, so the, the the Solera system is kind of the same system, in fact, but the only difference is that for the Solera, you use wooden cask, and for the Perpetual Reza, we use stainless steel. So it doesn't give the same uh, uh, aromatic profile to the wine, but this is the idea of the Solera, is to uh, blend different vintages together, and at the end, to, to put it in just one, one vat. So you always have... Uh, in maybe in 50 years, maybe, we don't know, we will have probably one drop of the first vintage, which was 2012, but it's kept it, it's kept in the, in the stainless steel vat. So that's the big difference. It was, it was Wonderful. Stainless. And for members who are less familiar, so each year you would you will take some of that wine, and we'll talk about it when we get on to collection, but you take some of that wine to add to other wines, exactly. but you're constantly topping it up, right? Exactly. So for yes. members who are less familiar with that Solera system concept, uh, the perpetual blend or the perpetual, yes, exactly. reserve. perpetual reserve. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexi. I'll, I'll let you carry on. Uh, so now that we've been to the to the cellar, uh, what do what do we have after? Do ah, but yes, yes, of course, Anderson, uh, Anderson. I don't know if you want to start the 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 tasting now, uh, Anna, but we 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 can. Or if you have any question about the house, or I mean, it's uh, it's a uh, as you as you prefer, but we can we can start the tasting. The, the I think if if people have the quartet as I do, please do taste. Um, Alexi's going to talk a little about uh, about their Californian estate. As I mentioned in the email, members, we are then going to focus on the collection, uh, the two four two, and a mention of the two four three. But if you have quartet, actively encourage. I know I will. Uh, to taste along, and then we will do a little tasting after after Alexi's spoken very briefly about it. 
Yeah, so Quartet, like I was saying earlier, so it was the first investment of uh, Rodriguez Estate was the first investment of, uh, of uh, Jean-Claude Rousseau. Uh, so in 1982, in fact, and it's located in Anderson Valley. So it's not Napa Valley because, uh, as you probably know, a lot of different houses went to uh, Napa, which was the, the kind of the trend. But in fact, in Napa, uh, the, the climate is, is pretty, pretty hot. Uh, and not really suited for for um, sparkling wine, and that's why Jean Claude Rousseau decided to to um, uh, create this this winery in uh, in Anderson Valley because in fact, as you can see on the on the picture, we have a really cool climate with uh, with foggy foggy mornings, which is really good for the for the for the grapes, and where we can in fact uh, have some similarities, and we 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 find kind of the same climate and terroir. As, uh, as the champagne uh, as the champagne region so it was really really the best region to to invest for sparkling wine and uh, and uh, it didn't prove wrong to to Jean Claude Rousseau because now uh, Rodre estate is really famous uh, on the in the in the US is one of the of the most famous and most recognized uh, sparkling wine uh, everything is almost sold to the US market uh, so few bottles are uh, are uh, distributed and sold in Europe uh, in fact, we don't even uh, have it in France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we uh, created this quartet uh, name because we didn't want any uh, confusion with uh, Rodrer, uh, Champagne, and Rodrer Estate in, in Europe. So in fact, quartet is the same wine as, uh, as Rodrer Estate, but different, different label. And quartet means that uh, this wine particularly comes from Four uh, plots who have been selected in uh, in uh, in Anderson Valley to produce to produce the the quartet. So quartet, uh, um, comparing to Rodrer, is a uh, is a big difference in terms of blending because it's a it's a majority of Chardonnay. In fact, we use more Chardonnay for uh, for quartet than in our um, uh, yeah than in the, the Maison where we are a more Pinot Noir driven Maison. Um, but the Chardonnay gives a really elegant uh, taste. And because we are in this cool climate of Anderson Valley, we have this really elegant Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir. And the idea is to is really to have a, a, a kind of the same uh, vision and, uh, and methods as Rodrer. So we once again do a low malolactic fermentation for, uh, for quartet. And, uh, and the dosage is a little bit higher than in Champagne. It's around 10 grams of, uh, of sugar per, uh, per liter rather than uh, eight, eight grams for a collection in the rest of the, of the range at, uh, at Rodrer. But it makes a wine which is really round, really rich, and really uh, easy to drink, in fact. And we, we keep it for two years and a half in, uh, in the cellar. So a minimum of two years. And then after the, the disgorgement, we put the wine back in, uh, in the cellar so the, the, the liqueur de dosage can harmonize with the, with the wine. It's got a really lovely approachable, um, it's sort of classy, but approachable, this wine. It's very friendly. I think you're right. That dosage um, has balanced. It's got still got lovely freshness, but the yes. dos dosage balances it beautifully. So it it's sort of almost a champagne for people who, well, it's obviously not champagne, sorry, but it's, you can tell us, <laughs> you can tell us it's got the touch of a champagne house, yeah, exactly. but it's got that new world kind of sun, bottled sunshine feeling. And yeah, and maybe one could just add was... one thing, and that's Sorry, the um, uh, along with the champagne uh, style of, of champagne making that uh, the, the house of Rodra make in champagne, they're using the same method for quartet, where they actually they're using some reserve wines which are aged in wood, uh, in the big vats. So that's uh, you know it was quite a. It's not something that most people do, no. but it does give a distinct character. And that, I think, is, you know, an expression of Louis Roger's style of sparkling wine. Yeah, definitely. And we put we put around from 10 to 20 percent of reserve wine in the blend of, uh, of Quartet, in fact, Wonderful. the majority of, uh, of Chardonnay. If members are tasting Quartet, please do um, let us know what you think. Tim, uh, behind the scenes this evening, has said it's been a favourite for him ever since he got it wrong in a blind tasting exam for WSET. <laughs> Described it as a vintage champagne, which shows how good he thought it was. So there we are. <laughs> I remember it well, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for members who uh, uh, followed our wine champions, it was also a wine champions winner this year. 
So in the blind yeah. tasting of sparkling wine that we do, really blind, genuinely blind, uh, our, our buyers for the price category gave it a gold star. So there we go. Delicious. Um, before we move on to collection as well, um, which is obviously going to be quite a large focus, I thought since we're moving to France uh, permanently with the, the next wines, I've had two members ask, so I think I'll ask now, do Rhoda have any plans to grow grapes in the UK? That's a, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, we, we have a, a nice anecdote with Mark about this when uh, Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon came to, came to the came to the UK. Uh, but it's not it's not in uh, in the vision right now. We I know that uh, Frédéric Rousseau and Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon came to the UK a few years ago. Um, they they were I mean they checked if it was interesting or not. They decided that it was not the best time to invest in the UK. Uh, a, a lot of our uh, uh, um, competitors did that. Uh, but it's not it's not in our plan at the at the moment. So we we don't focus on the on the UK. Maybe one day, maybe one day. But it's not in the in the plans at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I, I could just add something. I, I did take them around some vineyards, uh, and they had a good look. Uh, but in the end, as you said, Alexi, they decided to spend their money elsewhere, and they decided to shake open the piggy bank. And instead of buying land in England, they bought uh, Chateau Pichon, Comtesse de la Lande, in, in, in Poyac instead. Not a bad investment, actually, as it <laughs> turned out. And, and it was a rare opportunity. It's only the second time since the 17th century that the Chateau has changed hands. So you've got the, the quick or the hungry there. Uh, you've got to get in quick if you want to buy one, the great Chateau of Bordeaux. And they have that. They bought that instead. So I don't think there's no, there's no regrets there. It was a, definitely a good call. Uh, but in, you know, English sparkling wines, we do recognise them as being uh, there are a lot of excellent quality English sparkling wines. So it's not because Rhoda are in any way dismissing uh, the potential uh, yeah. for winemaking in England at all. Uh, it's really a matter of opportunities uh, and choosing the moment. Yeah, exactly, exactly, Mark. Well, thank you so much. The progress with sparkling English sparkling I was absolutely. Um, uh, tremendous in in the in the last few years. I mean, yeah. now in blind tasting, you can you can taste English sparkling, which are really really good, really beautiful. So yeah, that's right. Shall we move to collection now? Okay. So like Anna said, it's going to be the big focus uh, because there is uh, a lot of things to say about this this new cuvee. Um, so collection, we actually released it uh, in twenty twenty one. After many years of uh, of uh, brut premier, maybe some of you remember brut premier before. Uh, that was a cuvee. It was our non vintage. It was created in 1986 by Jean Claude Rousseau himself. And the idea of brut premier uh, back in the days was to um, to fight for ripeness. You know, because we didn't have this climate change before. We had uh, tough tough weather and rainy rainy uh, winter and, uh, and and it was it was really tough so the idea was to with the the uh, reserve wine aged in oak the idea was to bring the complexity to the wine to make it a little bit rounder uh, and to try to fight for this ripeness that we didn't especially had had in this uh, in our grapes uh, but now after like 30 years it's the total opposite we had the climate change happening and like I was saying before, we have the more sugar, we have more concentration in the grapes. So now uh, it's not to fight for ripeness, it's to fight for freshness. So the concept and the philosophy is, is totally different. And that's why um, Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon had the idea of this, uh, of this collection. <clears throat> because uh, years after years, the only solution we had with Brut Premier was to reduce the dosage more and more. So we went from 12 grams of sugar to uh, uh, nine grams of, of sugar uh, for the last uh, uh, release of Brut Premier, but it was it was not the it was let's say the easiest way to 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 be uh, to to make the wine fresher. So we we didn't want just to have the easiest way. We wanted to rethink totally the concept of uh, of non vintage, and that's why we created collections thanks to this perpetual reserve that we just uh, talked about earlier. Um, to add another level of complexity to bring this freshness and to keep this complexity as well because the, the reserve wine aged in oak are really the, the, the DNA of Rodrin. So we just we wanted to, to keep to keep this signature, of course. 
Um, and that's why we um, we changed the philosophy and and by creating collection, uh, as you can see, we have the blend of the grapes. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Meunier, we have a blend of uh, different years with the reservoir as well. And we have a blend of different reservoirs, so uh, aged oak, oak age, sorry, and uh, stainless steel. So in fact, it's it's just a wine about blending. And this is really what we wanted to show in this wine is the art of blending. And that's why we don't want to call it uh, non-vintage anymore, but multi-vintage, because uh, in a way, non-vintage makes no sense. You know, it's a blend of different vintages, uh, grape variety, and uh, different level of, of complexity. So the, the right word to, to use would be the would be the multi-vintage uh, um, category. And that's kind of a new a new philosophy that we add uh, to the to the to the range of uh, of champagne. We also uh, wanted to call it so collection and with the, the number here. So 242 and 243 uh, has just been released a few weeks uh, earlier. And why we wanted to put a number. So the number means, for example, for 242, it means that it's a sec the 242nd blend of the house since its creation in 1776. And the idea to put a number is that each release, each new number, will be uh, slightly different in taste because we don't want, because the idea, the philosophy is that we wanted to consider champagne as a wine. And as you know, in Bordeaux, in Rhone Valley, in everywhere in the world, each year is different. So each year the taste is different. And in champagne for many years, the, the philosophy was to create the same taste each year. But if you had a good year with a good Chardonnay, for example, uh, you just you don't want to put uh, more Pinot Noir uh, if the Chardonnay is better. So we rethink totally the, the concept and we thought that it would be better to try to make the best champagne each year instead of trying to make the same taste each year. And that's why we are now completely free to change the blend uh, at each release of collection. So that's why uh, it's, uh, each number will be slightly different from one to, to another and the blend will be different as well. So it's a, it's a complete change of philosophy, and I think this is really the right way to go because uh, we have to we have to take what nature gives us. In fact, so it makes sense. It makes sense. It's not once again. It's not a, a marketing tool or whatever. It's just it just makes sense. It's just what nature gives gives us. So I think it's really kind of really clever, and uh, and once again we're really really excited about this uh, this new cuvee. Um, so collection, for example, two for two. For the first time in the Rodin history, it was a, a, a Chardonnay-driven uh, multi-vintage because we put a majority of Chardonnay in the blend, uh, which is 42% of, uh, of Chardonnay, 36 of Pinot Noir, and 22 of Meunier. The base wine for 242 is 2017, uh, with a majority of, uh, of, uh, of the blend, which is approximately seven, uh, 56%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then we have the Perpetual Reserve, which is uh, 30, 34, 35. Uh, and finally, we have this 10% uh, of reserve wine uh, aged in oak barrels. So once again, all this kind of uh, blending, year, uh, grape variety, etc., etc. And that's why collection is really uh, the, the, the multi-vintage now of the house. But when you think about it, I mean, in a commercial point of view, when we released the, the, the collection, it was during the, the covid uh, and and Brut Premier was working really well. In fact, I mean, uh, it, it represents eighty percent of our production. Uh, we shipped, you know, we ordered, we shipped in one hundred and ten countries, uh, maybe a bit more now. So I mean, it was working really well. And 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 Jean Baptiste Caillon and Frédéric Rousseau told us that they wanted to release collection. Uh, I mean, for a product that were Brut Premier that were going really well. And during the COVID situation, so as a commercial point of, of view, we were a little bit scared. Uh, because it was kind of new and, and it was it really, was. yeah, it was really risky, you know. But once again, it's because we are completely independent and we are free to do whatever we want that we decided to launch this new QA. And in fact, the feedbacks were absolutely, absolutely amazing. So we were kind of a relief at the export team, <laughs> which was great. But uh, no, no, the wine is, uh, is absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, delicious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, could, I mean, maybe I could just add one point about uh, the the whole concept of of collection and giving a number. Um, and one thing that um, Jean Baptiste Le Caillon said to me the other day, he said, um, "Of course, by giving a number, 
um, a bit like a vintage champagne. It means that uh, people consider it on its own specific merits. And it means that people who, you know, there is a big following now for champagne of people as for collectors uh, and, and comparing different vintages and so on. And I think it takes the, the, uh, it gives the wine more of a sort of wine feeling in terms of concept, as opposed to just being champagne or just being non-vintage champagne. You just, you know, drink a glass as an aperitif. And they're saying, you know, Rhoda have always made quite sort of wine, winey wine, champagnes, if you like, in the sense the wine has, you know, their wine, their champagne wine has character and flavor and complexity. And it's not just a simple fizz, if you like. And that's always been the, 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 the style of the house. But I think by going, by changing and moving away from the idea of non vintages giving it a number, means that people then will take it even more seriously, if you like, as a wine. It's still fun. It's still got bubbles. It still goes pop when you open the bottle, which is great. And it's exciting. But um, for those people who are really serious wine lovers, they will love this wine too, because, because it has real character. Mm -hmm. and, and then they can have the fun of trying different, you know, as the years go by, maybe I keep a few bottles back. That. <laughs> and then do some comparisons and everything. And that would be great fun. Um, and uh, and when you taste the wine, to my mind, you have this. As Alexis said, you've got this freshness, which comes from the Reserve Perpetuelle and from the wine of the year. Um, but also, I think the, 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 the Reserve Perpetuelle, which is this blend of different vintages, wines of different vintages, uh, is an expression of the different vineyards' ownership mm -hmm. of Louis Rodra. And that is a continuity of style, which will happen every year. So you've got this sort of solid base, which is about 30 to 40% of what's in the bottle is actually wines from the same vineyards every year, um, and which blended together. And therefore they create a sort of harmonious style, mm -hmm. which is the heart of the blend. And then added to that, you've got the wines aged in the oak foudre. There's no taste of wood, but it's slightly more evolved, oxidative style of wine aging and that gives an extra character to the wine and then you've got the wine of the year which is about half of what's in the bottle and the wine of the year in this case is 2017 which is a year as Alexi was saying which is all about um, freshness and energy and perhaps a little bit more the, the Chardonnay was particularly successful so therefore this little bit of uh, focus on the Chardonnay gives us a sort of touch of ripeness but at the same time the wine has quite a crisp acidity, and therefore it's always a little bit more mineral in style. And when we get to the next vintage base, which is 243, which we've just started importing now into the UK, and in fact, the next wine that is bought by the Wine Society will be 243. In fact, it was actually ordered, some was ordered today. Um, that wine is different because that's based on 2018 vintage. So then there's a little story about that, and you'll find that there are differences. And even on the back label, uh, you can see the uh, there is information about the wine, mm -hmm. uh, about all the wines that are in there. And there's a QR code. Um, I'm gonna, it's hard to show you here, but uh, there's a QR code, which you can zap with your phone, and you can get loads of extra information about that particular cuvee. I, I do have to say I love this idea um, and it sounds like some members are in agreement. It speaks to exactly as you said, Mark, people who want to have a good quality glass of champagne, but they also want one with some personality and some differences. And I did hear a good adage. Um, I can't remember who said it, but that your brute premier used to not feel quite related to to the other wines. I think they, they use the word the cousins. Whereas this is very much the sort of child. It inherits all the great stuff of Cristal and, and of the vintage wines. But it has its own fun little little quirk each year, which I think yeah. is... Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think this, if you like, collection is closer to Cristal than Brut Premier was. And I, I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're now when we, when we look at the wines in the range, when you've got obviously a Cristal at the top, the ultimate level, which is from the, you know, very best vineyards in the best years um, with a terrific amount of character and an amazing ability to age because it cuts the particular soils where they've chosen vineyards with deep chalk. Um, so it's got this fantastic longevity and freshness. 
and complexity and depth of flavor, but at the same time without being heavy in heavy, so any sense at all. And then I think in some ways that the collection, where, where collection is nearer in some ways to that, than for example, the vintage Cougar we're going to taste, which is based mainly on the expression of Pinot Noir from the Montagne de Reims. So, so there you've got a slightly different style and equally the rosé, you know, occasionally you, at, at the wine side, you've had the rosé uh, cuvee, uh, which comes basically from the Marne Valley. <clears throat> and you have a different style of wine there or the Blanc de Blanc from the Cote de Blanc. So I think that the collection, because it's a blend of wines uh, from vineyards in the Montagne de Reims and the Marne Valley and the Cote de Blanc, is an expression which is closer to Cristal than any of the other wines in, 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 in the range. So I think it's great fun. And I think it's just, you know, the finesse, the elegance, the complexity is, is you know, definitely it's a step up. Um, and, and I think, it, you know, people are recognizing that and it's getting fantastic reviews. The press love it too. Um, and so we're, we're very, very happy. And as Alexi said, we were, you know, in, on the commercial side of the business, we were pretty nervous when when Rhoda said they're giving up Brute Premier, because well, hang on, if it ain't broke, don't you know, don't mend it. You know, why no, what are you doing? But uh, we're now we're very, very happy. <laughs> and just before we um compare the 243, I would like to just tell members um quickly, because we are going to talk about the 243 for good reason. And the reason is that we are low, well, we're running out of 242. So if you're tasting along this evening and you're enjoying it, please do get an order in because it won't last very long. And as Mark just mentioned, we as a business have just ordered the 243. So we're ready to change over and, and stocks are running low. So please, please get your orders in. And as you might spot here as well, um, we currently have the six, case, the six bottle case on offer. And again, historically, our champagne offer would run until the end of the month, but we are actually finishing all champagne offers by Christmas. So please, again, I encourage you, if you're tasting along this evening and enjoying it, I know I certainly am, and you are keen to get an order into it sooner rather than later. Um, not that the 242, uh, 243 will be a disappointment. Alexi's going to talk about that now so that he can prepare you for 2023, but it will <laughs> obviously be different for all the reasons I've just mentioned. So I'll hand over to you, Alexi, perfectly to talk about 243. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes, uh, so 243, so like we were saying earlier, so uh, different blending, different base wine. Uh, so base wine for 243 is 2018, which was in the champagne history, a unique, unique vintage. Uh, the quality was just at the top and the quantity as well. So we never had uh, so much, uh, so many grapes uh, in, the, in the vines. And the quality was just uh, amazing. So in uh, in 2018, uh, champagne, the champagne region produced a lot, a lot of champagne, but with a lot and a top top quality. So you will you will have you will definitely taste the difference between 242 and 243. Um, to me, 243 is definitely more uh, it has definitely more salinity, uh, more. Um, um, Yes, the salinity where you you know where you salivate, where you have this freshness as well, rather than seventeen. Seventeen, in fact, was was a, was a complicated year, um, uh, and and we, for example, we didn't produce any crystal in twenty seventeen. Um, so the taste the taste will be will be quite different from from twenty uh, two four two and two four three. Uh, the blend is also a little bit different, so we have um, a little bit more of Pinot Noir and a little bit less of Meunier. Uh, in this uh, in this cuvee, uh, and uh, and we also have more uh, base wine. So 20, 2018 is about sixty percent of of base wine in this in this cuvee, um, compared to a little bit less for for two for two. Um, so once again, we have this uh, this uh, freedom of of uh, having the the blend that we want. If it's a year for Pinot Noir, we will make uh, a majority a blend with majority of Pinot Noir. If it's still a year for the for the Chardonnay, we'll keep the Chardonnay. So once again, the idea with collection is to uh, to keep your wine, uh, to age it a little bit, to age it a little bit, and uh, and that's why it's called collection. In fact, huh? because you can you can keep the wine and trade your own collection. And after a few years, you just you know you take a two for two and you can compare it with a two for five, a two fifty, and then check the difference, uh, the base year. And like Mark was saying with the application with the QR code, you can just check it and see the date of this disgorgement, uh, the date of harvest as well. We, I mean, we give a lot of information. Once again, the idea is to be uh, the more transparent as possible. 
because we have nothing to hide in, in our wine. And, and I think that's this is what, what people want to, to, to know uh, now. So that's that's different between uh, between 242 and uh, and 243. But we keep, of course, the road hair style. We'll never make, we'll never make, for example, an, an oxidative champagne. You know, this is not road hair style. So the blend will be slightly different, taste will change, but we will not go uh, at uh, uh, the total opposite of what, what we are doing, of course, of course. Wonderful, thank you. Feels like a prestige cuvee, but with a, a more affordable price tag. Yes, <laughs> so yes. <I> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But if you take if you take the non-vintage category or multi-vintage category, Louis Rodin is, is is clearly at the top of, of this of this category in terms of uh, of uh, image, in terms of, of uh, uh, work in the in the in the vineyard, in the in the cellars as well, uh, and that reflects uh, why we are at the top of the price positioning as well, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, it's tasting absolutely beautiful. I should yes, say that yes. as well. For members who are who aren't tasting along, it's absolutely gorgeous, amazing, rich character, but also that freshness that you've mentioned really comes through, um, which is actually quite incredible. I mean, I when you think about all those old vintages that are in there, bringing the complexity, but still tastes lovely and youthful, and like it's got yes. a long way, yes. long way to go, as you said. And then last but not least, we are moving on to the 214. Yes, vintage, which is, to be honest with you, my favorite of the range, except except uh, Crystal, of course. But uh, yes, so vintage, maybe maybe we can just uh, move to the map again, Anna, please, so I can just show where it's made, because when it comes to the, vin to the vintage champagne uh, in our range, we really have a, a precise, precise location for our champagne. I don't know if you can, if you can zoom out, if you can zoom in. Sorry. Uh, oh yes, that's perfect. That's perfect. So for the for the vintage, so um, we once again we want this time we are we have very specific location for the vintage, and we uh, we decided to to take only uh, two locations, two terroirs, so two soils. Um, for the Pinot Noir and for the Chardonnay. So in fact, this is uh, this is all Grand Cru, our vintage. Uh, so the Pinot Noir comes from Verzi, which is um, uh, just you know the the small triangle. Yes, exactly. So this is coming from Verzi, and the the, the particularity of Verzi and our vineyard in Verzi is that all the Pinot Noir is facing north. So in fact, Verzi is a real uh, a soil for Pinot Noir. This is really where you can find the best Pinot Noir of the, of the Champagne. And we have a north-facing vineyard, uh, not to have um, too heavy Pinot Noir or something too rich, but to have elegant Pinot Noir. Once again, to keep the freshness in our wines. So that's that's for the Pinot Noir, which is approximately 70% of the, of the blend, and the rest for Chardonnay. And the Chardonnay comes from a Grand Cru um, a village as well, from in the Côte des Blancs, which is Chouilly, which is in the north of the Côte des Blancs. Yes, just right there. And Chouilly, uh, once again, Grand Cru, so we have absolutely a beautiful Chardonnay, which are really fresh, really elegant as well. And that's why um, uh, with the, the vintage, so with the vintage, we have fresh grapes. I mean, really fresh uh, uh, raw material, raw raw uh, fruit. And in the cellars, we will uh, vinify a part of the of the cuvee in oak barrels. So this way, once again, we have the freshness of the grapes. We have the, the freshness of the soil, of the terroir, of the chalk. But we bring uh, this uh, complexity and this roundness thanks to the vinification in the oak barrels as, as well. So that's why in the, in the, in the vintage, you, you can see that we, we have a step up uh, comparing to, to collection, uh, which is more structured, more, uh, you can say more powerful as well, but still in the, in the, in the freshness and in the complexity and, uh, and in the elegance as well. And how would you describe the 2014 vintage? Um, obviously, again, I apologize, members. I'm sure some of you bought it. In fact, I know you did because you've been saying you're drinking it in the chat. Um, many of you will have bought it for this tasting. So we've had a run on the 2014 vintage, which means we are now sold out, as you can see here. But what that also means is that we've got the 15 coming in. So if it's all right with you, Alexi, would you be able to compare the two? Uh, yeah, so those course, drinking the, the 14 will. So a bit, a bit like 17, 14 was a bit, uh, a bit complicated. But hopefully, uh, just before the harvest, we had few weeks of uh, of really 
really hot weather, so it saved it saved the the, the vintage. But during during uh, spring, uh, spring was kind of uh, of cold and kind of rainy, so it was not it was not really good for the for the vineyards. But after just before the harvest, like I was saying, a few weeks before, we had a very uh, continental uh, weather and really hot uh, hot summer, so it was just perfect for the grapes to concentrate all the all the flavors. And in fact, 2014 is uh, is uh, after vinification uh, was really expressive. So you can you can really feel it in the glass. 14, you you have this expression of fruit, which is really uh, really nice. And compared to 15, this time 15 was a really hot vintage. Uh, 15 was uh, was really hot. So uh, we we once more we had to keep the freshness in our wine that was that was a big challenge for for 15 but you will find in the 15 uh, something which is more uh, yeah more continental more concentrated as well for the for the vintage so then it's uh, like a personal taste huh? so we can't uh, really uh, tell what, which one is better there is no no right answer to this uh, to this question but uh, yeah two different years two different years that's for sure and in terms of the production of the vintage, how does that differ? Obviously, there's no blending of years uh, no. naturally, but did, what's the um, what's the process um, with the grapes? So, is there some blind tasting? Do you age anything uh, before in your Van Clare before blending? Yeah. So you know, so it, by by law, um, a non-vintage has to be uh, kept in the cellars for uh, fifteen months, and a vintage for three years at least. Uh, so for collection, uh, we keep it uh, three years and a half in the cellars. Three years, disgorgement, and another six months uh, after uh, the, the liqueur de dosage. And for the vintage, we keep it for four years and a half, so one more year uh, in the cellars. So um, so the wine can be really ready to drink. Uh, and um, and in terms in terms of production, uh, so once again, we 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 vinify the wine in oak barrels. We do very low malolactic fermentation to keep to keep the freshness, to keep the acidity. And uh, and yes, and yes, and yes. I think that's all. What what, what was your 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 question, Anna? No, that's perfect. That's exactly what I asked. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Because <laughs> talk too much. Um, no. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, and Mark, do you have anything to add about the vintages? Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I think um, 14 for me is beginning to show some nice maturity. Um, and it's got, it's got a more, um, sorry, it's not a, no. No, we lost Mark. Uh, I think, yes. Yes, we have. We've lost Mark for a moment there. Um, he was mentioning the maturity though. Yeah. and. Ah, sorry, I'm back now. Yeah, sorry, I just there's a noise in the background. I was trying to avoid. Um, the um, yeah, what I, what I find is that the 14 uh, is already now beginning to show some age. I mean, it is after all eight years old. So you know, for a lot of white wines, you know, their life would be over for a lot of white wines at eight years old. But of course, with champagne, because the wine is uh, with carbon dioxide gas in it, because of the way the wine is made. And because it's slow maturing wine, it's still uh, it's just getting towards its maturity now. Um, and I think it's I find it a very complete and, and, and delicious wine for drinking now. But it will age, of course, a lot longer. And the 15, in my mind, is a little bit the acidity is slightly sort of more evident. It's slightly fresher. The, 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 the fruit is a little bit tighter. It's not quite so obvious at this moment. But I think maybe the potential for 15 could even be longer than than it was for the for the for the 14, because the 15 was a particularly good year. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, all the grapes were absolutely perfectly ripe. They were picked at the right moment. Um, and and it was just, you know, it was just a sort of an ideal year, really, uh, 15. So I think uh, both 14 and 15 are lovely ventures in Champagne. But I think possibly uh, in the long term, I think possibly the 15 will eclipse the 14. Yeah. But in the short term, 14 is just so lovely now that mm -hmm. it's, it's perfect for the next sort of, say, five years. I would think the 14 will show better than the 15. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you go long term, you may find that in the end, 15 will, will, will make 
you know longer bones if you like whatever uh but um you know for most of us of course you know that'll all be history because we'll, we'll it'll all have been drunk but um <laughs> so i think they are they're are, they are different style of year um and that's the fun really isn't it that's the fun of wine that it is different every year and so you know we just take the pleasure in that it's not necessarily competition between the years you know what i mean it's just they will have their own character and, and i think that's terrific absolutely um, and I've got one question that I think would be quite helpful to members. I, I know from even the calibre of some of the questions we've had tonight, there are many Louis Roderer super fans in the audience this evening. But uh, we have also had a question that I think is a brilliant one to help members who are less familiar with the house. And that is sort of to contextualise who is similar to Louis Roderer or um, are there comparisons to other houses that you're comfortable? Perhaps, Mark, you might even be a great person to say this. For somebody who's never tried Rhodera before, where do they sit in the world of the Champagne houses? So my my arrogant answer would be no one is similar to Louis Roderer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I thought that would be your answer, Alexi. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's, let's stay, let's stay uh, humble, of course. Um it's it's really hard to to say. Uh, I mean, I mean, each each house has its own personality. Uh, if you take, uh, for example, uh, Boulanger, I mean, they are they are in the in the oxidative approach, which is which is great. Once again, there is no wrong or right in in, in the approach. It's just a uh, personality of wine, a different style, which is which is good as well. I mean, Boulanger is a is a really well known house, really recognized. Uh, the wine are, are good, so absolutely no problem about that. But Compared to order, it's in fact two different styles. I would say it's, it's mm -hmm. opposite of style. Um, then, then in the in the in the range of the the other houses, we have of course the I mean the, the houses where we compete the most are definitely Boulanger, um, Ruinard, Villecar Salmon, Charletique uh, as well, Paul Roger, uh, which is which is Paul Roger in fact uh, similar to Louis Rodin in terms mm -hmm. of uh, blending, in terms of, uh, of uh, it's it's a Pinot Noir uh, driven house as well. Uh, but once again, they have their unique touches. So every each house is is, is quite unique in its uh, in its personality. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I think Anna, the, the the other thing we could say is that um, you know we you at the Wine Society, along with uh, a number of other merchants, have started importing more champagnes from small producers, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they're individual. They have their own vineyards. Um, and they're they're just single single vineyard um, producers, and um, <clears throat> Louis Roder is not a single vineyard producer. You know they've got lovely vineyards all over the in the, the heart of, of the, you know amongst the best vineyards of the region. So in fact, what Roder are offering, I think, is really uh, an expression of the best that Champagne can make. You mm -hmm. can also look at individual vineyard plots, and you can say, well, that is an interesting wine in itself. But I think what the 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 what Roder offer really is a, is a balanced expression of champagne at its best level. So mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily one is wrong or right, but it's just it is an expression of the best of champagne. And I think um, that's really what what people are buying, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And in the past, we've only been able to taste wines that were blended from different villages and different uh, and different uh, grape varieties. And now we're beginning to see more wines which are from single plots. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But in the end, um, I mean, if, if you know, if you want to have a wine which is, if you like, perfectly balanced, you can sometimes get beautiful wines from single plots in a particularly good year. But I think I suppose what you're really getting from, from a house like Louis Rodra is, you know, excellence of quality and that balance which will work you know, in, in to some extent in every vintage. And in the best years, you're getting, you know, the ultimate champagne. So mm -hmm. um, nobody's wrong or right, but I think it's great fun. Um, you know, it's, we're just lucky. I think it's a golden era, actually, mm -hmm. for champagne. And I think that, that climate change, which, you know, in many ways is extremely worrying and causes massive problems. But at the same time, uh, just simply in terms of uh, temperatures, um, and as we know, the, you know, the grapes are ripening a lot earlier um, because of higher temperatures in the summer. And, and that, of course, has been a blessing in a way for champagne. And of course, it's a blessing for English wines, um, mm -hmm. but it's been a blessing for champagne. It means that we get virtually vintage quality um, every year, which, which is something extraordinary. There are obviously downsides on that as well. 
and um, we can't go into all the details now but i mean there, there are pluses and minuses but the the you know the, the simplest way of looking at it is saying we can virtually make a vintage champagne every year mm. so so people are not chapterizing in the same way mm-hmm. you know people, Rhoda haven't chapterized apart from possibly one vintage for the last 20 years you know and yet in the old days you know you had to chapterize every year because you simply couldn't get even 10% of alcohol from the grapes because they didn't ripen enough whereas now you know you're struggling sometimes to to pick them early enough before they get overripe so you know there are many things which have been changing recently um and some of these things changes actually have been positive mm-hmm. now, you know, a few it... years, <clears throat> sorry a few years ago the, the abv on the back label was was 12% now since since few years it's 12 and a half so that's mm-hmm. that's really where we're struggling to to keep to keep the this this level uh, uh, at the at the lowest. So this really means that the climate change is, is happening, and and uh, and that's why it's so it's kind of sometimes like you said a problem, but for us in terms of flavors, it can be an opportunity as well. Mm-hmm. It feels like the collection range is possible because of those changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like that this is something that has led to a pretty seismic but very very delicious to, to change in in the house so yeah well I must thank you both so much and um members thank you for joining <laughs> as well Tim behind the scenes I have to thank Sarah Knowles for actually uh not being able to host and for me to get these three wines so thank you Sarah <laughs> thank you Sarah in your absence because I've had um the pleasure of tasting three incredible wines this evening members yeah. If you're not familiar with Rodera, I, I hope that you're now more familiar. And for those of you that are, I hope that you've um, gained a little understanding, but also had wonderful insight from both Alexi and Mark tonight. So thank you so much, both of you, especially Alexi, joining us in the in the tasting room. We didn't even mention uh, the Rodera <laughs> tasting room, which looks incredible. Yeah. So thank you very much for dialing in and, and staying late this evening. It really has been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you in the new year. But uh, I will be raising a glass of Louis Rader for sure at Christmas. We had one member say he'll be lucky if his lasts until noon. <laughs> 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 so I think we can probably all agree with that. So thank you both so much. Okay. Really, really okay. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Good evening.